in the early days when I was a child, uh, there was a rule at home. We were let to the cinema on a wet Sunday. Always in the winter was grand. We always got to the cinema. But then in the summer, you weren't allowed to go to the cinema. You were brought for a walk because it was healthier, get fresh air. Cinema could do in the winter. We used to pray for a wet day, a wet Sunday. We could go to the cinema. I heard there was a job as an apprentice projectionist going down in the old town hall, which is now the present town hall. And the then manager there was a Patty Cunningham. And I went and I asked him. I heard there was a job going, I said, for an apprentice projectionist. And the next question he asked was, when can you start? No such thing as a CV. Nothing. So I started. And... Um, that's where it all began, in the old town hall. What was a big thing at the time was uh, horror films, kung fu films, and gangster films. They would be all the rave at that time. And um, we used to have a rowdy crowd. But if you kept kind of tabs on them with a light, they'd be okay. But one night we had... Um, a very an incident where there was four or five and they carried on terrible and we had an awful night of them and it was the custom of the time that you didn't really go in and pull them out that time you could you can't do it now you could go in and eject them out but um, you didn't want to fuss upsetting the other people and you kind of more or less kept tabs on them so it wasn't too bad but when they were going in as we told them they weren't coming in no more were barred and that was it but normally when you'd bear a person they would um, you'd meet them up the chip shop maybe a night or two after or maybe that night and they'd say oh it wasn't me now that did it it wasn't me now it was the other fella and when can I get in and can I get in to see such a film and I promise I won't do it again and that'd be the end of that but on this particular case anyways they came back again the following week and um, we didn't let them in so, and one of them going out, he turned back and he kicked me into the stomach. And um, I was pretty sore after it. And um, I said, you're gone for good anyways, my own mind. But he was, um, they went off and I didn't see them then for a few weeks, a few months after that. So they came back anyways and they all apologised. So I let them all in except that I had to kick me. I didn't think he was ready for going in at that stage. So he went off anyways. And he would keep coming down week after week with the rest. So one night, I let the other crowd in and I said, you weren't going in. So about an hour after, I went around the back to do something. That time we had our stores at the side of the cinema. And he was there and it was lashing rain. So I kind of felt sorry for him. So I said, come on, I said, trying to bury the hatchet so he went in anyways and I let him into the end of the show and the then manager there he said uh, well I think it's time he's his pin and stun so we let him in and then he going out he shook hands with me and he said he was sorry but he didn't mean it because he heard I'd gone to hospital as well in the meantime and he thought it was a result of that but it wasn't but it didn't help either but um, he came in every week after that for a couple of weeks and everything was fine and the last night he had come, he came over to me and he said, you know, he said, I really am sorry, he said. I know you are, I said. Don't worry about it, I said. I'll see you next week. Right, he said. Next week, anyways, he didn't come. So, in them days, you knew your audience. You knew what night they'd come. You knew what time they'd come. And you, you know where they were sitting and all. So, I was wondering where he was. So, the next day, anyways, I'd heard that um, he had been killed the night before in an accident. And of course I was sorry. But I was glad in a way that I gave him the chance. At least I was able to say afterwards, well I gave him the chance to come to the cinema. And he could have come if he wanted to. Whereas if I hadn't given him the chance, I'd have had it in my conscience that if I'd let him in, he'd be alive today. But that was the way it was to be. But, uh, but I think it was, 19, yeah, it was 19, September 1978. 
I went to the Tata. I would love to work in the Tata Palace because the hours were shorter. The uh, morning I did a bit of office work. Two hours in the morning. And I was free then again until about half past seven in the evening. And you were finished by half past ten at night. I was asked to move over as a projectionist or manager. Manager projectionist. Two jobs in one. I discovered then after doing a bit of um, management work as well that you couldn't do both. You cannot concentrate on two jobs in one. So I decided to give up management. And that's when we got other managers in then. And I stuck full time with projection. This is actually a couple of trailers I'm using at the moment. Now, films would come in cans actually like that, but they would be bigger. And it's our job then to take each can out and to make sure you have the head forward all the time going on to your platter. We we'll say that's real one, we'll say, and this is real two of the film. I'm putting this together now to show on the screen. So I have to check both frames to make sure they're synchronised. Otherwise, if I didn't, when they come on the screen, you would have a line in the centre of the screen. It's what you call a rack. So I'm going to splice it here now. Like this. See, it's level now with that. So this is my splicer here. No. So that's spliced that side. back together now. Then you have to do the opposite side or if you don't it could break going through the gate of the projector and then you're in trouble. Now what some projectors might do is when they come across a spice like that when they were splicing it on again you see when it's over I cut it and normally we peel off the piece of tape or you can cut a frame but by cutting a frame you're shortening the life of the film. You see this? Did you get your camera in there? Mm -hmm. That's actually a giant of the film there now. That's one reel, two reel, three reel, four reel, five reel. That now is about 90 minutes of film. Average. Then you have your trailers in here and your ads. Oh, right. So when I turn it up now, it'll be the ads that will be coming out first. This is the module. I will take out this reel now. This down here. Now, you want to get this now? It's going in here and out through the module. In here. And push it in here. Bring it down. Down to the bottom pulley. These are called pulleys. Up to the top, fully. Over here now. And we go down to the front. This is just here. We we'll bring it up here to the top, fully. You see? Mm -hmm. This is what we use as a framer. So when it goes on the screen, it should come straight onto the screen, the film. Yeah, let's try it up. That's it. And it goes in here. And this here now is where the the light will come on now and to go through here and out into the lens and out onto the screen. Bring it in here to the cellar. Yeah. And she's ready now to roll. There
Right. Here we're now up at the uh, digital, the future of the cinema to come. And um, this is here is what we call a hard drive. And as you can see there, this is the hard drive itself of today's film that's been ingested. As you can see there, the leads, they're all going into it there. In fact, it's actually ingested. But that is the key which will actually give the number and the process of the film. Without that, you cannot show it. So this is actually the hard drive now. You could be talking about maybe three hours, four hours, five hours of film in it. Obviously, it's only about two hours. And this is the old 35 film. So, the past, the future. The flat, as I said, was the home and the founder home of the film flat. But um, the films then, were, they were okay, majority of them were okay. But you would get the odd film that would be um, tricky. But I remember one film in particular, it was a film called Buddy and Clyde. And it was Arthur Pinn that directed it. And he was actually in Galway for it. Now when you get a film, as I said, they come in 20 million spools, maybe 15 million, and you have to put them together. Normally that would take about about a half an hour if you do it right. Make sure you have it right. Soundtrack right and everything. But I'll never forget that film. It took me about seven or eight hours to try to get it together. Because every time I put it on the uh, auto rewind, to rewind it onto the spool it would snap. It was in a thousand shreds. And what happened was, there were two prints. There was a print that was for the bin. And a good print sent to Galway. So if someone got it wrong in dispatch, they put the good print in the bin and the bad print was sent to Galway by mistake. So all they were worried about was to get Arthur Pin's name up on the screen to make sure that that went okay and they would whisk him off into the Ortolan Hotel for dinner. But they did tell him it was in bad shape. He didn't mind. And they did tell the audience that there would be lots of... Um, bits missing out of it and that it may break but I think the Lord was on our side that night it actually went through everything was fine but as I said we had lost about 8 minutes of it between the bits that was missing but as soon as Arthur Pin's name came up on the screen it was taken off um, when the Omniplex was being built on the Hedford Road it took them a long time to get a foundation because it's bogland I should know because I lived just across the road from it I was humming and hawing whether I go or not. So I was actually told about a month before the Omniplex was ready to open its doors that there was no future in the Fleda. So I decided to take it then. So I came here as a chief projectionist. It was a big jump from two screen cinema to a seven screen cinema. I was frightened. I mean seven screens, longer hours, where I was in the Fleda was shorter hours. And uh, when I came here first, we used to have a little window from projection looking down onto the foyer. And you really felt a part of the building. You see people coming and going. And it was nice. And when you'd have your films on, you could sit down and read the paper, but keep an eye. And you could be watching out the window. And the lovely thing about it was I was seeing people coming to the cinema that I hadn't seen for years. And they were going into the third generation. I remember them coming in as children. I remember them growing up as adults and now they were coming in with their own children. So you could see I could see three, three generations of families coming in. And then when we modernised the cinemas back in the late, in the early 2000 and something, three or four, they took away my window. And it was, it was, the place was dead after that. But we lived with it, we had no choice. I, uh, my health wasn't great in uh, 2010, so I've had a lot of tests and stuff, and it was discovered that I was beginning to get arthritis, and my hands and my back would be affected, and I decided I think it's time to call it a day. It was the break of my heart having to leave, because as I said, I love the business. And um, I didn't really want to retire, 
but I knew at the time had come that it wouldn't be fair to my colleagues here in the cinema, it wouldn't be fair to the company, and it definitely wouldn't be fair to the audience if anything went wrong. And I wasn't able to keep up to speed that I should have been, that I would be expected. But uh, I thought it was time to retire. But uh, it was a fright, but I'm enjoying it. It's lonely. It can be lonely at times. But uh, when the fine weather's around, I get in and get out. But I still keep coming up and down. I keep in contact with the staff here, and I come to an odd film. And in saying that, then digital came in. And I'm not a great fan of digital. Now I know it's the way forward. But as I say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But I got the basics of it. And it is good. The clarity of it is good. Of course it is. And it's the future. But there'll always be a fondness there, I think, for 35.